Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. He's a prominent figure in the Western Australian Christian landscape. He was part of KI, leading Kingdom Investors in Western Australia for more than nine years. He's currently the West Australian convener of the uh, Australian Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. He has taught leadership and leadership development at the Australian School of Ministry. He's a father, he's a husband, and he's a wonderful man of God with Scottish blood in Australia. Friends, I welcome to the show and I want you to welcome to the show with me, Bobby Aiken. Bobby, welcome to Kingdom Stories from Down Under. You know what we do here? We profile people from Australia. I know you're Scottish, but you are in Australia now. Yep. Have you been, uh, uh, have you become a citizen? I am, yep. You're naturalized? Scottish by birth, Australian by choice. By choice. <laughs> At what age did you come here? Uh, I was 23 when I first came out to Australia back in 1999. So without parents on your own? Yeah, I came out. I took a year out from university. Mm -hmm. I was um, in a not too happy place in my life and felt that there was a couple of people, my uncle who um, was here in, in Perth until recently um, and he, he invited me to come out here and I thought, well, there's a great opportunity to take a year out from uni and go and see what it's like on the other side of the planet. How do the Scottish people see Australia from Scotland? Uh, home and away neighbours. Yeah? Yeah, that's what we see. It's it's beaches, sunshine, that's pretty much it. English speaking? Well, within Australian the speaking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of Scot uh, Scot Scottish people in Australia and yep. a lot of Scottish people visiting Australia, so not so much anymore. No, not because of COVID, of course. <laughs> there, there used to be, but not so much anymore. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you grew up in Aberdeen. I grew up in a small town just outside Aberdeen, mm -hmm. um, Aberdeen, the granite city, oil capital of Europe. Yep. Um, my dad was in the oil industry, so being in and around Aberdeen, he grew up in the area. The town that I grew up in was also the town my dad grew up in. Yes. So we. Um, the house that my parents live in today was my grandparents' house. We'd been That's there for beautiful. generations. My elder brother and his wife and children, my aunts, uncles, cousins, a lot of them still reside in that little town in Scotland. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, how many siblings do you have? I've got two. I'm a middle child, so yes. So but older yeah. brother? Elder brother and a younger brother. There's three okay. boys three in the family. Nice. Yes, my poor nice. mother. Did you play football as a young lad? Um, Played uh, a bit of football, yeah. I I was never the greatest at football. I played more rugby. So if I did play football, I played in goal. Yes. Yeah. You you had agility. Were you pretty good? Uh, I, look, I just um, I was much better at grab get my hands to the ball than I was at getting my feet yeah. to it. So it was a little bit like that. And I suppose you were an Aberdeen fan. Born and bred. I've always been a home team supporter. Yes. It's just. The way I've always been, Aberdeen were the home team, so I always supported my home team. And it was a good era for Aberdeen. It was a great era for Aberdeen when I was growing up. Yeah, we had were you Alex watching Ferguson. the games live? Yeah, we used to go in. My dad used to take us into the games all the time. Was it pricey? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I wasn't paying. So, it's yeah, I'm, I don't really remember. I don't think it was, not compared to what there are to these days. No. Yeah. This was in mid-80s or late-80s? Uh, yeah, mid-80s. Mid-80s, yeah. okay. Okay. So it wasn't, oh, I mean, the fan base was still crazy, but it wasn't this hype, this money hype that is associated no, with football these days. Not at all, no. And look, the Scottish League is a bit different to the English League. It's not as hyped there. Um, yeah. There's there's a couple of clubs that everybody knows of that have kind of gone down that track, but the most of it isn't. A, it's still yeah. grassroots. Yeah. Yeah, there's people that break in from... from yeah. Scotland, they don't have to import all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what was life uh, as a child? Um, life was good. My dad was in the oil industry, um, lived in a beautiful home, 
my folks, uh, because dad was in the oil industry, he was away from home a lot, okay. traveling the world. He was the vice president, did a lot of traveling. Um, but we, I went to boarding school and things like okay. that. So, yeah, just number of different things. The three of us were quite different growing up. So my parents treated us as individuals. We were yeah. schooled differently. We were treated differently growing up, which um, at the time I resented a little bit. But grow, having grown up, I kind of understand more that actually that was more beneficial than I appreciated. it. Who had that awareness, your mum or your dad, about your individuality and your skills? and Probably more my mum because she was the one we spent more time with, Okay, I would imagine. But then well, I was involved vocation? in the conversation, so it's always hard to retrospectively look and answer that, isn't it? What was her job or My mum was a trained nurse. So okay. when she met my dad, she was a qualified nurse mm -hmm. and she was serving at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what were their values at home? Um, was there Christianity in the house? Or um, much? When we were really young, we were kind of taken to church on Sunday. It was kind of one of these things that was expected, so it kind of happened. But it was... Was this it was a never really church? Was it a oh, very church of, um, church of Scotland? Okay. So similar to the kinda, Church of England. Yeah, similar. Um, you walk into the church. You got the wooden pews. You yep. sing the hymn, stand up. You've got the kind of list of we're going to be doing this number, this number, this number. Choose from your hymnal thing. Um, I've actually still got a copy of the hymnal at home, you know. Um, but the the, the, the church experience was something we did on a Sunday. It yeah. wasn't... It was cultural. Yeah, it was It was something... Church was something you attended. It wasn't anything beyond that. Were there friends? Did you make friends with other kids? Oh, yeah, yeah. And loads. And because I grew up in a small town oh, in so Scotland. Oh, so you knew each other. So we all knew each other. Okay. Yeah. It's the, there were the kids I went to school with. There were the kids that I saw when I went out weekends. There were the kids you played football with. They were... You know, it was all... It was all the same people. They're the same people I meet when I go back there these days. And when you went to boarding school, did you go in Aberdeen or in another town? No, I actually went to boarding school in Edinburgh. Okay. So that was during a time my dad had been relocated to predominantly working in... He was kind of living in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, my my folks... Had, my mum was originally going to go out there and stay with him for a while, but then it was decided that wasn't going to work. Um, in order to make things, I, I was sent to boarding school. My elder brother was coming close to finishing school, so he stayed at the school he was in Aberdeen, and my younger brother just just protested about the idea of going to boarding school, and so he didn't go. Yeah. yeah. How were your teenage years? Were you keeping yourself entertained? Um, you could say that, yeah. Um, about the age of 12... I, I kind of had a bit of an encounter with, in fact, my uncle, who was responsible for bringing me out to Australia, and many years later came out, and as a result, a number of us had gone to visit a church that my aunts had been going to. Yeah. And we went to this church, and it was very different to the kind of stale, um, oh, I don't know, but that kind of, that still very rigid kind of church yeah. that we had visited to on, on a kind of semi-regular basis. and. I recognized something different about the people there. Well, in kind of a flip to that, about three months later, the, the, where I grew up, the, the one of the prevalent kind of sports and entertainments was the skateboarding and things like that. We yeah. were one of the first towns in the whole of Scotland where the kids had got together and then my brother and a number of his mates got together and they raised enough funds to build a skate park, to build a skate park which was a, it was a basic ball to begin yeah. with. But it started, that was a great place to start, and that became a hangout. Yes. Um, and so we used to go down there and hang out. It was a small Scottish town, so even at the age of 12, my folks weren't worried about us just picking up our skateboards and running yeah. off down, you know, doing that kind of thing, running off down and going skating and coming back as long as we were home before lights went out, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And in one piece. Yeah, well, that's it. Ah, if you came home with a couple of pieces, it was all right. As long as you had the other pieces in a bag, you were fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were in that environment. But but in that, you were hanging out with a lot of older kids. There was a lot of stuff going on. And I remember being there one day, and effectively, they were all kind of hanging around smoking, and somebody just passed at me a joint. And that was kind of at the age of 12, and you kind of peer pressure everybody's around, and you just go, well, all the big kids are doing it. 
you know and, so. and that's kind of the level yeah. of your thought processes yeah. at this time you know um, and that kind of started what became the pattern for the pretty much the next decade yeah for you for me yeah but it was very common oh it it was more uncommon not to Yes. Or in in some of the circles that I So was it just weed? Was it just marijuana? Well, it started with that. But by the time I was kind of 14, 15, um, it started to become acid, amphetamines, and then ecstasy, then cocaine. And, you know, I mean, it's one yeah. of these things that, um, yeah, not, and not everybody went down that path, but that was really kind of the way things went. Was it affecting your study? Um. I would like to say, uh, well, I mean, the reality is it must have. Yes. But I have a natural gift for learning. Okay. So, which is the only thing that pulled me through is a natural gift that God gave me years ago before I even knew of it. But I didn't, I never really felt I had to study when I was at school. Yeah. And I was coming through with really good results. Yeah. Um, Even when I was in senior school, finishing up. Um, I would just have fun and play around because I was, quite frankly, bored. Yeah. But nobody picked up on it. Mm-hmm. So I carried on just doing what I was doing. And then they would come back to me really surprised when I'd get You weren't really touching your potential at all. But you were, no. you were flying, uh, you know, uh, for what was asked of you. There was not a problem. Yeah. And I look, I think looking back, I think part of what led me into the path that I was down was the fact that I was so utterly bored Yeah. that I you needed was struggling to get stimulation. So yeah. I ended up, I mean, I must admit for most of the decade, somebody asked me if I've ever, if I'd ever been stoned. And I said, yeah, well I was once, but it was for a decade. Yeah. You know, and it was pretty much that way. I mean, we were, we got to the point where we would smoke or consume dope every day. Yeah. Um, it was just natural. It, it wasn't a case of How will did you I afford it? Um, well, that's where you kind of get into things where you start selling it. You start kind of figuring out these methods and means. My parents were quite wealthy. Yes. So I was never really short of money. And They didn't know you were smoking. No, 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 they wouldn't have. No. Maybe. Were you smoking cigarettes as well? Well, th- this is the funny thing. Well, I mean, it's probably not funny, but uh, the strange thing is, kind of, we. I ended up smoking cigarettes. Yeah. In the cover. times when I couldn't smoke marijuana, because yeah. we ended up mixing tobacco with the marijuana, yeah. and so it effectively got linked into the smoking cigarettes yeah. as a result of smoking marijuana, <laughs> not the other way around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, look. I mean, it's it's just kind of these this this pattern of history that kind of began to degrade and days kind of melded together and yeah were you having any relationships with the girls or how was it um yeah quite sadly i mean that was one of the things where you don't understand things like soul ties and all these kind of i mean there was never taught it was not something that we were introduced to so i mean sadly i i had some some lovely girls that probably i treated far far well not probably definitely were treated far less than they deserved yeah and you, you're talking about some relationships that get measured in hours rather than days months yeah. and years you know i um i'm now coming up fortunately to my 21st wedding anniversary and you see a completely different life where you sit back going you know of all the things i wish these things had been done differently but yeah you can't go back can you no you can inspire others to yeah, yeah. To, obviously look after themselves and not go on the same path yeah and a lot of let I me mean, let's be honest a lot of people i know i was never taught that stuff yes i know it was never even mentioned to me in yeah. fact it was quite acceptable in the society i grew yeah. up in um i would even go as far as almost encouraged in some yeah. regards to have girlfriends oh in the peer kind of and also uh, sometimes even your parents would encourage yeah. you you know it just it keeps you out, <laughs> out of mischief it, it was better to have a girlfriend thing. than to go to prison or to be on the streets yeah, and it, so so you've got these funny things that you just don't uh, you don't realize how significant they are until you understand the spiritual dimension. Yeah, and then you understand the eternal uh, the kind of eternal ramifications of things that you were told were yeah. just uh, as as the term they use is sowing your wild oats and all these types of terms yes. that they kind of they almost jokingly talk about and make acceptable. Yeah. It? You, you look back and you go, that that's horrendous. Yeah. 
So uh, what made you come to Australia? So your uncle was here. Did you try and get away from that situation? Uh, Were you doing well at uni? Was it a, I a breakdown? Been, or? Well, it, it was a number of different things. So I was, I'd been gone back to studying because I needed to do something with my life and really wasn't sure what. bit of pressure from my parents. I was kind of drifting in and out of kind of jobs that weren't really going anywhere and were nowhere near re- recognizing my potential. Yeah. And so I agreed to go to university. I thought it was a bit of a kind of like get out of jail free clause. I thought, how hard can this really be? I'll go to university, I'll do a degree in business computing. Um, into my second year and I was at a friend's place and we were sitting there smoking dope and chilling and just hanging out. And as we were leaving, we were kind of going down the stairs. Now my mate had been decorating his apartment. Yeah. And he was like, right, okay, we're gonna go and put the, paint cans up and I don't know if you're familiar with kind of the the way that the tenement flat type thing the the kind of blocks of flats and things are in Scotland but basically you've got kind of six six to eight floors depending on which building you're in Uh, two flats on either side of a central staircase yeah communal basement where basically the basement is segmented up into kind of cages and then you've got a communal attic where everybody's got kind of allocated space in the attic well, a month before this, unbeknownst to us, um, well, in fact, so we're going off down the stairs, and my mate and another guy were going to put some paint up into the attic, and I just hear this call, Bobby, will you come here? And I'm like, okay. Okay, what's, what's this? He's just trying to wind me up because I'm walking down the stairs. He just wants me walking up and down the stairs again just to win yeah. there. Um, no elevators available, and he no. lived right on the top floor. So um, I go, okay, we'll walk back up the stairs. We'll see where we're at. Turned around. He goes, no, seriously, come up here because I'm seeing something. I really need you to come here and tell me, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And I could hear there was something in his tone of voice that was, he's not actually taking the mickey. There's something going on here. So I went back up the stairs and I hate heights. And the, the way it works is there's kind of a ladder embedded in the wall that you pull out but when you pull it out, where it stops, it stops with its back against the railing of where the railings curve round, and there's basically the drop down the center of the stairwell. So I know as soon as I get on this ladder, I'm on this kind of rickety old wooden ladder, which doesn't feel too secure on its own anyway. Behind me, there's this huge drop, and I'm thinking, I'm not looking behind me, I'm not stopping, I get on the ladder, and I just raced up the stairs into the attic. Yes. And so when I'm kind of on the flat floor in the attic, I'm thinking, right, okay, I'm on safe. solid ground effectively now, I'm all safe. But I'd done that so quickly, I hadn't been paying attention to what was in front of me. And basically from where you are to me was the body of a guy who'd been hanging from the rafters for at least a month, if not longer. Oh. And he'd used the cable from a heater that he basically cut off and wrapped around his neck. And anyway, it was a horrific sight. So no one um, went in the attic for a month? Well, no. So this is, it wasn't, people didn't frequent the attic. It's where you stuck yeah. stuff and just kind of left it. Yeah. This guy, unfortunately, had been on day release from the local kind of psych ward. Yes. And they had been looking for him a month Good before, fun. but nobody had thought to check the attic. Because the doors were all sealed up, the, the ladder was all in place. It didn't look like anybody had been up there. Yeah. So ha- somehow he got himself up there and made it look like he wasn't there. Yeah, he loved it. In order, so, but anyway, I mean, really tragic, absolutely horrible. But you're absolutely smack bang confronted with something. And given that we were kind of stoned at the time, it just kind of, all these alarm bells went off and... What I didn't know at the time, and I do thoroughly recognize now, is it's one of these times where I feel that God was pushing me into a place where I could then become open to realizing something else. Because you do start asking yourself the questions about mortality. Yeah. You know, this wasn't the first time that I'd have had an encounter with something close to suicide. Yeah. Fortunately, in the past, I'd been able to help people kind of avert the circumstances. Yes. But this time, you're confronted. Mm. Um, and it really, I, I really struggled with it. So yeah. I, I ended up dropping out of uni. Um, I ended up drinking lots, delving into the drugs, and all my coping mechanisms kind yes. of fired in, uh, which began a spiral so that by December 1998, I wasn't living at home. I was arguing with the family. I was just, most of my core relationships had broken down, and the relationships you I did it. have. You basically lost it. 
um, or with other people who were just quite happy to party along with me. Yeah. Right? Um, a lot of great guys um, that I'm still in touch with who, who were quite happy, but there was just that, it was just, I was in a pretty horrible dark place. Uh, I remember on Christmas Day 1998, the only direct contact I had with my family was my elder brother turned up on the doorstep and he dropped all my presents that had been bought and he said, the best thing you can do for us is just stay away. Wow. And so whilst I had a couple of friends say, look, don't be on your own on Christmas Day, come and sit with my family, I just absolutely felt, you know, I, mean, I was like, I'm not, I just couldn't do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. I sat on my own that Christmas day and just smoked and drank and consumed whatever else. No suicidal, uh, su uh, suicidal thoughts? No, not at that time. It wasn't, there was uh, there was none of that that crept yeah. in for me. It was, um, I was, I was just in a place where I just thought I'm on my own. I'm just gonna, just gonna wait and uh, yeah, just kind of, hold on to the next party you're in the middle of, i mean we used to see christmas and new yeah. year's party season yeah it was just one party after another and no work uh no, well I, I was working but at the same time everybody shuts down yeah so that's yeah I mean. yeah there's, there's holiday period, time um pubs are open late and all this kind of stuff and the party atmosphere all the students come back all that kind of stuff so yeah it was it was just party atmosphere but and then your uncle my out. uncle was actually in Scotland at that point in time. So my uncle, who sadly recently passed away, yeah. um, he, 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 he had come to Australia many years ago, almost at the same age as I was effectively yes. when I first came out. And he, he had come here, he got saved and basically climbed to the pinnacle of the legal profession. He was a QC at that point in time, but he was also the pastor of an outreach of churchlands. Um, okay at that point in time and yeah so he came to stay he had come to visit the family and he had put a request through some of the family members to say look i'm only here for a short time i very rarely come to scotland would you come to a big family dinner just so i can say hello and i kind of said right okay i'll do that on the one condition i don't have to sit anywhere near my family and we can kind of navigate and anyway, he came and had a chat with me and said, look, how about you just come to Australia for a while? Yeah. And so one of the things that he wouldn't have known at that point, I know he knows since because he's heard my testimony before, but the one recurring dream I always had growing up was, with, was of a place with beautiful beaches, shining sunshine, everything, everything that you don't get in Scotland. Yeah. Um, uh, well, no, that's not true. There are some beautiful beaches, but it doesn't come with like sunshine. <laughs> um, but, but in that, it was the type of place I never had words to describe until yes. such time as Home and Away and Neighbours came on the TV. And okay. you then begin to go, well, this isn't just a dream. There's actually real places like this. And so this offer to come to Australia, when, when it was presented to me, it was almost like part of me already had said yes before I'd even consciously thought through what that really meant. Wow. Um, and so five, six months later, I was in Australia. So you flew to Perth directly? Flew directly to Perth. I've got two uncles that were here, and my uncle David's still here. Uh, they both, like my uncle David was in the police force, and so I flew in, stayed with him originally, Yes. and then went on to stay with my uncle John. Okay, yeah. and what, what happened there? Well, Interestingly enough, so when I went to stay with my Uncle John, I was living in a house and began to live in amongst a community of believers because they had people coming and going, they were running the church, and during the week there was stuff going on at their outreach center, there was all this stuff going on. The guy that was run, their youth pastor at the time, a guy called Warren Harvey, he, he himself had come through Teen Challenge. Yeah. So I was directly in contact on a regular basis with not, not a lot better to do than hang around. Um, and Warren still jokes today that he had me in youth ministry before I gave my life to Christ. <laughs> so we were in doing that kind of stuff. And I was just able to connect with someone who 
yeah, he could have preached at me and everything else, but the fact was he'd actually walked a similar path to I had. You know, I, yeah. I, I with the various differences, but there was a lot of similarities. Yes. And so I was able to talk to someone who actually wasn't talking theoretical, wasn't trying to beat me over the head, was able to have conversations, um, and just made himself open to say, look, I know some of this might sound weird or whatever, but if you want to chat anytime you can. So one of the things being brought up through boarding school and other things, we were always taught to respect. So when, yeah. when my uncle said, well, do you want to come to church? They never put any pressure on me to do yeah. so. Staying in their house, I was like, well, you're running the church. It's respectful. I'll come along. And even if I just hang outside and smoke cigarettes or whatever else, I'll at least I've made an effort, you know, and yeah. showing some kind of level of respect. Um, but then just got, got a hold of me and just wouldn't let go effectively. So on the 28th of July, the home they stayed in at the time was a place called Berea. And they had this extension on the back that was built as a kind of for the church to be housed in. And that's where I was staying. And on the 28th of July, I was just sat there and I just couldn't sleep. And I just knew from what I, I knew, I now know looking back. So you, you were only in Australia God. for a couple of months? Or a bit more? Six, six weeks or something okay. by that point. Six yeah. to eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah, six to eight weeks. And um, So you can't sleep? Couldn't sleep. What I now know was the presence of God, but couldn't yes. couldn't have told you what was at the time. Um, I was just there's. I just can't sleep. Just can't sleep. And it just became really, really conscious that God wasn't going to let me sleep until I made a decision. So I could have made the decision any way I wanted, yeah. but I wasn't going to sleep until I made a decision. And at that point... There was I just, no one there, just you and God. There was nobody there. I was all on my own. It was one o'clock in the morning. Everybody else is snoring. Yeah. Um, and I'm just there, and it was just just this incredible presence. And I was like, right, okay. And I just dropped to my knees, and that was it. The just complete reality of looking at my life through the lens of the different things that I've kind of become aware of during my time staying there and um, yeah it was it was just this immense sense of I want to step into this space and so I just submitted dropped to my knees submitted my life to Christ and the the next instance I was being I just kind of felt it from the tip of my head start to flow down as though somebody had tipped warm oil or liquid light over yes. my head. And I literally felt it just run down over me and just all over my whole body until I would felt like I was completely coated yeah. in yeah, this liquid light, this anointing oil or whatever, but it was just warm and it, it, it literally flowed down over. And it was the most incredible sensation. I remember it so clearly. And it was, uh, yeah. It, it was surreal, but it was real. Oh, it was definitely real. I yeah. can, I, I mean, even now I can remember it. But I just remember knowing there's nothing physically there that I can see. Yeah. But I could feel it and I just knew the sensation, you know. But yeah. it was slow and warm and, you know, it was, it was just incredible. Beautiful. And then you shared with your uncle, I suppose, immediately, the next um, day? I didn't actually. I I had this thing where I was like, right, okay, who do I tell? What do I go? Where does this go? Um, and so the first person I shared with was Warren Harvey. Okay. Because I felt that he had been directly really instrumental in that. Yeah. And then... And then interestingly, I just felt God wanted the next person I told to be my mum. So I waited. Uh, so yeah, so I waited. Until she called. No, 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 until that night, that Sunday night. So it was a Sunday, it was one o'clock in the morning Sunday. So we went to church after that. That's where I had a chat with Warren, told him. Um, he presented me with a Bible. And then that night I spoke to my mum and I told her what had happened. Yeah. And then after I'd spoken to my mum, I told my uncle and my aunt. And um, I don't know, there was just something that felt that was the right order in which to do things. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Beautiful. Um, 
And interestingly, did mum know what that meant? Um, I think my mum was really blown away to the point whereby she went actually went back and made a commitment to Christ and has been involved in the church to this day as well as, as a result of oh wow as a result of that um, which which is is wonderful because I get to call my mom and we have conversations about what's going on I send her books and different things just Beautiful. to help her on her faith journey which is really interesting when you almost get the tables turned on the relationship a little bit yeah. b- b- bizarrely but yeah just that interesting kind of thing that's happened and it's that beautiful connection that you then have where you can converse and talk in regard to those things and then you began a journey of ministry um well to be honest the next four years were more a journey of understanding my faith so i i when i first came in i was in a working holiday visa which meant i had a a limited amount of time to be in australia So the, the first week that I was a Christian was a phenomenal. The Tuesday, I, on the Tuesday, I was offered a car to borrow to get me around because I was living, I was staying up in Mount Helena and, oh, yeah. right, it's not easy to get around, as you yeah. know, when you're on the peripheries of Perth. Tra- back then, public transport wasn't fantastic. And whilst you Once could an do hour, it, maybe it was, a peak yeah, hours. It wasn't great. But there was, um, one of the local community groups had a car sitting idle and they, Warren through some connections they offered him the car that I could drive so that I was like wow so on the Wednesday Warren and I went down to check out the car and it turned out it just had a dead battery so we pulled the battery out in the process I am not mechanical right <laughs> I have gifts and I have talents but being a mechanic is not on them right and, and I managed to spill battery acid all over my clothes oh. so but then we went back to the local outreach center for the church. And um, when we got there, there was a young lady who was looking after the kids for the women's ministry. Yeah. Um, well, she and I have now been married for almost 21 years. And that was our first meeting and our first conversation. Of course, the longer the conversation carries on, the less clothes I'm wearing because the battery acid is beginning to eat through my clothes. So we, that, was, that was day kind of two. Then on Thursday, I got phoned up and offered a job. Wow, car, so, wife, job. Yeah, all all in three days. So it was a busy <laughs> week. Um, and Saved. Yeah, first yeah, of yeah. All. yeah, yeah. Meet Jesus, and then you get this kind of cascade of things. Um, and so I then was working, doing bits and pieces. I went out and worked in South Australia for three months and things. But we were then, um, I was, we were baptized together on the fifth of September up at Lake Lechenoltia. Um, oh, nice. I then proposed to her on the same spot on the fifth of December. And we were then married on the 27th of May the following year, just in time for us to fly out. My visa actually ran out while we were on our honeymoon. Oh. Came, ba- came back in, almost didn't get back into the country, but was allowed grace for a couple of weeks to come in, grab our stuff and go back to Scotland. This time she went with you. Yeah, she came with me and we went back to Scotland so I could finish my degree so that we could come back here. and. That was a really interesting, I say interesting four years, hellish might be a more accurate description because... The, so you spent another four years in uh, Scotland? Yeah, another four years in Scotland. Uh, we and went back in 2000 and came back here in 2004. So that was, I, I we were getting on the plane and one of the things, the question, and I don't know whether it was coming from a heavenly source or a demonic source, I just had this question going around in my head. What if the faith that you have isn't real it's just borrowed from everybody around you good question and i i was sitting there going wow what if that's true what if that's real and the the reality of it was the next four years were all about answering that question because we went right back into you didn't have the support you didn't have no no support no connections nothing um all of my friends none of them were christians did you you attend a church did you get in a community or we did but a lot of the churches were not of the kind of ilk of the ones that we had here and we tried to connect with churches, and we found it so difficult to find a church where we really felt comfortable we found a couple of great churches but it was almost like God had I put this veil over us. Seriously, we attended one church in Aberdeen, which we loved the church. It was great. It was lovely. The community ate together and all this. 
we sat in almost we, we sat in the same seat almost every week. Yeah. And the the family that sat in front of us were the same family every week, and every week they introduced themselves to us. <laughs> and it was this surreal thing where we just felt Groundhog like, Day. It was. It was a little bit like that. And we're like, we know who you are, we know all your names. But they could not remember us. It was almost like they were and so we felt we felt Okay, so there's something strange going on here. Either, and we just took it as a sign that we're not supposed to be in that church. As much as we liked it, yes, we just took it as a sign that that wasn't where God wanted us. Mm. So I ended up joining the church with my mom, which I was actually fantastic for a while because my mom, I pick up my grandfather in the mornings, yes, and my mom, my grandfather, and I would go to church together. And that was just great, being able to go and do that. And whilst there was bits and pieces of the church, I was like, okay, it doesn't quite resonate with what I was doing yes. here. One of the things that God began to show me was, well, it's that's irrelevant because it's not about us, it's about Him. Yeah. And if our heart is truly to worship, then actually you can go, and nowadays I get to go and visit a number of the different churches and denominations around the city and all the different bits and pieces. And I love the different aspects and the different flavors, um, right from the kind of more stri- what we consider the more traditional church, yes. right the way through to the kind of the, the more kind of charismatic Pentecostal churches, where you know, there's huge differences, but there's huge similarities as well. Yeah. But each of them is worshiping God in their own way, and there's some beauty in each and every aspect of it. And so that was something that God really showed me in looking at these things was not go looking for what I wanted, but begin to actually really resonate and go, well, where do you want me? Because it's actually you that's got to point me to where you want me to learn Uh, from and all that stuff. So different perspective. Yeah. And how is is Nadine adjusting to all of this? Nadia. Nadia. Uh, Yeah. Um, Well, Nadia was 19. Okay. Okay. So Nadia had to adjust with the fact that as a 19 year old, she was suddenly on the other side of the planet with less than optimal weather conditions by her <laughs> upbringing. From Australia to Scotland. Everything else. Um, she was working, we were doing things. So, I mean, she, amazing woman. She has put up with so much of my crap. Um, and just, just so strong and amazing that she's just, yeah. Uh, she's, our, our marriage has been 21 years is fully testament to her because yeah. One of the things that was a real challenge was I went back into the world that I knew okay. and friends, friends temptations. and temptations. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't win every battle. The yeah. fact that I'd become saved didn't mean that I suddenly wasn't tempted by any of all that stuff. And it was so natural to me yeah. that it was really, really bizarre because there's part of me that's going, no, that's horrendous. And there was another part of me going, what are you talking about? That's You've just always the way things done this. are. This, we've always done it. Yeah. Um, but the, the interesting thing was, even being immersed back into some of that, there was a, you know when you try something that you absolutely used to love, but for some reason it just doesn't taste the same anymore? There's like yeah. something to it, and it's just like, yeah. I used to really love that, but now it just doesn't taste very nice. Yeah. Well, there was constantly that. and You eat it habitually, but you don't actually feel the taste. It yeah. doesn't do it for you anymore. And that's really where I came to and I began to bit by bit kind of journey to this whole point where it was like, well, I'm going to click closer to Christ. I'm going to get closer and the beginning to shift things and bit by bit, Christ just kept drawing us back to him um, until one day, I mean, we had this beautiful... Was she stronger than you in the faith? Um, Certainly at times. We've had this great opportunity throughout our relationship where... And it was actually prophesied over us before we went back to Scotland that at times she would be the absolute rock that would hold us together and hold yeah. us to the faith and other times I would be. And that's exactly the way it was. The times that she was struggling, I was just locked in. And the times where I was struggling and off the rails, she was totally locked in and kept yes. us from kind of... And so that kind of kept us together and mm. kept us... Um, I suppose one of the things in this is... One of the things that always resonated with me was when I got married, I very consciously at that time, even as a very young Christian, was mindful that what I was doing was making a commitment to God, mm-hmm. not just making a commitment to Nadia. You okay. know, so yeah. in my mind... Yeah. It was profound, it was deep, the, the, it was the, the, an There was more to it, and if even if things were 
absolutely horrible between us, I still made a commitment to God. Yeah. So there was a commitment to then Covenant. try and work through and Idea. you know what I mean? That yeah. kind of thing. It wasn't a case of throw it all out the window, we'll just go and yeah. start again type thing, which sadly we see too much of in the world. Yes. Um and so we worked through that until we both came to a point where God just said it's time to go back. Yeah. Yeah. We knew we knew that our time in Scotland was done. We knew that we'd come through a really rocky time and had actually come to a point where God was saying it's now time to go back and it was almost virtually the day we got back to Australia that our ministry began in different forms wow mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure she was glad to be back now oh, you also had uh, many challenges with um, family life in terms of children didn't you yeah, so I, I mentioned when I met Nadia, she was looking after the kids for the women's ministry, ministry while yeah. we met. Um, she just loves kids, always yeah. has, always will, and just wanted to be wanted mom. to be a mum. Yeah. You know, um, unfortunately, we we were basically told that's not going to be possible. There was a number of factors on both sides that we were told just wouldn't it wasn't going to happen, and. And we prayed and we prayed and it was quite devastating because you get a lot of people who come around you and there's a lot of people that prophesy what God's saying and there's a lot of people that prophesy what they want God to say. Yeah, um, Hope. yeah and hopeful they're, prophetics. They're trying to be really nice, but there's a lot of soul prophecies that came to us during mm. that time that caused a lot more pain than they need good. And I know people were trying to encourage and give hope. But actually what they did was quite the inverse and as a result and it became this ro roller coaster ride of people telling us oh you're you're going to get pregnant and i foresee this and i foresee that and um yeah all, all of these things and of course nadia's spirits just lapped because her faith was yes. god's not lying to me god yeah. won't lie to me yeah and then of course the you go through the disappointment i'm not pregnant and stuff yeah. and you go up and down and up yeah. and down and it became this thing where actually when you heard the prophetic words, you got to the point where you were like, I wish you would just shut up. <laughs> it really, it did because yeah. you knew. You've heard it. You, you've heard it before and you know the pain that comes next if it doesn't yeah. come true. And I know, I mean, that sounds horrendous because you, you should be leaning in experience. to, it was the reality of our experience because everybody saw the, yes, that's wonderful, that's great, which when the prophetic word comes around, Nobody saw what happened behind closed doors when all of a sudden it doesn't come true and there's tears and there's yeah. pain and there's oh, all the rest of it. And it's regular. It's every oh, month and every absolutely. test and uh, going back to the doctors. I mean, we didn't have children for 11 years, so yeah. we, we went through that struggle as well. I mean, at a stage, even intimacy loses its flavor because you just have one aim. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you're, you're in another world, you know, you, you have this, you know, goal and everything is geared towards that goal and you even miss the person in front of you it's you know it affects everything mm. which yeah. is quite deep and then you decided to well so we, we we looked at ivf and we looked at all these things and we prayed about it and we heard all these conflicting reports that's yeah. playing god and all these yeah. different things that we heard and we thought well look we're going to investigate we're going to learn and we went to one clinic and um, they basically said, "Oh, look, what we'll do is we'll just harvest as many eggs as we can, and the ones that the ones that you don't want, we'll just give away." And we were like, oh. <laughs> "That's the last thing I'm, you want." I'm like, "I'm sorry, <laughs> but that our, our belief is that that's a human life, and of you course. can't just give away human yeah. life." You know, to me, it was, so at that point in time, we just felt God was saying, "No, we're closing the door yeah. on this." Um, which was heartbreaking, of course, because you knew the science it's, it's was a there, really the medical tough, science. Well, yeah, and also no. you probably qualified for a government, uh, a free government uh, assistance with this. Well, possibly. I don't. I mean, yeah. at the time, we just we just you do know that it's it's a, if it's very costly. It's about twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. Oh, I know. I've done it. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I know all about it. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every penny. Um, so yeah, at that time, God closed the door on it. And we yeah. just felt as much as we wanted it, yeah. that we had to honor God and just just say, look, we believe that at this time, that's not the right place. That's not yeah. the right way to go. Uh, and that was devastating. Yeah. Um, because because you had point, to make that choice. Yeah. And say no to, to this possibility. Yeah. Well, to yeah. that hope. We, you, we genuinely were at the point where we were, 
and more for Nadia than myself, I suppose, at the time. But I mean, one of the things that I was really conscious of was one of the things that no matter how much my desire was for children, I felt I had to hide that because I didn't want to add additional pressure yeah, to, to Nadia. So you couldn't even be yourself in this. Well, yeah, was, because you, you get yeah. to the point where you're like, look, I really want this, yeah. but I don't want you to feel like you're letting me down. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, and I'll just and the, hold. Yeah, and you, you kind I'll of get hold to, it in. yeah, you just kind of go, well, look, I'll just push that away because actually you don't need any more pressure. You're yeah. devastated enough. There's, you don't need any of that. And so that was kind of the way it went. Okay. Um, then through an opportunity of blessing, we came into and had the opportunity to, and it was a real blessing for him as well. We had the opportunity to adopt a son, yeah. and and I met him. Oh, he, he's an amazing boy. kid. He's yeah. absolutely amazing. He's almost an adult now. I yeah. shouldn't really call him a kid, but what yeah. he's seventeen now. He is so. seventeen. He will be eighteen later this year. But just a phenomenal yeah. young man. Um, it, uh, look, if anyone saw the two of you, they would have, they would never picked it up that he wasn't your son. Oh well, but he is my son. He you is. know what I mean? So yeah, it's, but I'm just saying. You know. No, absolutely. And it, it's that it's that interesting thing. When we were adopting, there was a lot of people and there was a lot of f- foolish people around who said, yeah. oh, well, you'll never love your child, the way, uh, adopted child the way. And, um, Nonsense. Oh, they Selfish just don't have a clue what they're talking about. No. I mean, um, that's the question we should put to them. Have you adopted? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know? I, I think people like that are actually talking from the fact that they don't think they could. Yeah, and they can't. Yeah, um, and but that was never true. the, choice, the no. case for us. It was very much something that God said, right, okay. And interestingly enough, just after the adoption went through, um, my wife had a meeting with a doctor who said, oh, by the way, you do realize if we did this, this, and this, you could actually potentially have a child. <laughs> and my wife just kind of lit up because as much as she loves having our son of course um she she always wanted that joy of being, yeah, pregnant being a mother and, yeah and going through the whole and giving birth experience. and so she's like can we do it and i said okay and then we went down this road and it seemed like every hurdle that had been there before um was really interesting the attitude we went to a new place we ended up going yeah. to a christian hospital who was running the ivf so their conversations were very different yeah there were a number of factors that had come in which meant we wasn't going to be able to harvest 10 eggs even if we wanted to yeah um, and so we had all these different factors and all of them looked like actually it was going to be more and more difficult um but it, it was almost it got to the point where god was like Right, you see, everything in the world tells you that you cannot have children. Yeah. I'm going to prove to you that I'm going to make it even harder, and then I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and that's what happened, because we went through, and this time we were taught by IVF in a way where they went, look, we've got to be honest with you. We're going to take the sperm and the egg, we're going to put them together, and then we're going to sit back and watch what happens. Yeah. Because effectively, that's what IVF that's what is. is. I mean, you know, everybody talks about playing God. They're no. not playing God, because no. they don't, they they don't decide... Do and I mean, we were amazed. They were going, well, this is how we decide whether they're viable or not. We match them up with ones that have looked viable in the past, and that's what we do. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, that's that's not playing God. I think me. the only um, sort of concern that people have with IVF is what do they do with the embryos that are absolutely. You know, and, that, and that was genuinely so our that's, concern. That's probably well. the only ethical, yep. you know, Christian ethical uh, concern that anyone would have. And we were in that boat, but as it turned out, I mean, it, it became a blessing. But I mean, initially we heard it was terrifying as a prospect, but then it became a blessing because we were told my wife didn't have very many eggs left to harvest. Yeah. And so you we were only, a, well, we, t- we took what eggs we could. Yeah. But of the ones that they then fertilized, only two were viable. Yes. So we came to the point that there was only two, and we had agreed long before this, regardless of how many were considered viable, we will take that we all. would take everyone yeah. to term. Yeah. Um, and we were told, okay, don't be surprised if the first one fails. Yeah. Um, well, the first one's about to turn three and a half, <laughs> and she's amazing. We, we called her Hope. Hope, that's um, beautiful. And she, yeah, she is amazing. She's incredible. Unfortunately, the second one didn't. Yeah. And that was that was quite heartbreaking. Sure. How uh, far did that go? Um, I think we were about 
eight weeks for mm. uh, yeah between four and eight weeks and it was just one of these things yeah. where you're kind of waiting in bits and pieces but yeah that's that's heartbreaking in its own way because I, what I and to be honest I actually still struggle with it some days because to me she was real yes from the moment that she, she was, was conceived implied, she was conceived yes of course okay and some people don't get that. And I mean, no. you talk about the whole abortion thing. I'm not going to go no, into no. that. But for me, she was real and she was a real life. Yeah. And she was my child yes. from the moment she was con- yeah. conceived and she yeah. was there as a viable embryo. Absolutely. Um, and so to lose that. A life. To lose alive. a life without ever having the opportunity to meet to, to say talk, hello and goodbye to, you know we, we had named her we knew you know we had all what these thoughts so she was to be named molly molly um and there there are some days where i'm just sitting there and you just suddenly get this kind of deep sadness that she's gone and we never got the chance to play with her and i what, what I I listen to Hope running around and she she'll turn around and she loves Frozen yes and she always talks about her sister yes and she always talks about her sister and I just get this deep sadness that she should have had a sister here yes. you know and I don't understand God's plans or any reasons yeah, yeah, of for, course. for why that I mean you've accepted it but the pain is still yeah, real yeah the pain's real yeah um, but, but the interesting thing is most other people don't understand that. So you don't get to have a kind of ceremony or memorial because yeah, no to, to other people, there's no there was nothing to close. Yeah. But to you, it was real. Mm, In your absolutely. experience, that was absolutely real. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was. You probably don't know, but we've, we've gone, after 11 years, we conceived mm. naturally. Again, we didn't choose the IVF option and uh, the doctor was very upset because mm. this was a government program which we declined and um, within two weeks after declining that program we conceived naturally yeah okay and then we lost that baby oh, at no. 20 weeks almost and it was a girl yeah okay so you wait 11 years then you conceive mm. and then you lose her and uh, i mean we had 3d uh, videos of her photos heartbeat everything i mean you know we, we went everywhere you know it was just such a joy yeah so many confirmations prophecy and everything that were coming to pass and we lost it mm-hmm. and it was painful and the pain was that we didn't know if we will conceive again you know we didn't know yeah. at the time how difficult it was and it was almost two years before we conceived again and now the you know our fourth child is on its way in june Mm. We'll have four children soon, three girls and a boy. And uh, we named her Yosha Bed. And um, our, our kids talk about her as well. Yeah, okay. You know, it's real to, to us. And, uh, you know, every time the day that um, 27th of uh, uh, June, when that day comes around, you know, my wife feels the pain, we feel the pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're not there anymore, but it's still uh, a scar that is yet to fully heal. Hmm. It does keep us grounded, it does give us a perspective, you know, she's in that cloud of witnesses awaiting us. Hmm. You know, I know she's got mom and dad and a few other people around her, but she's got Jesus yeah. and the Heavenly Father. And, uh, you know, it does provide more of a desire for you to make sure you finish your race well, because you'd want to meet her. Yeah, and I... I think for me, it also changes the way that I look at the children I have. Yeah, the value. Because I'm so appreciative of even the small moments with yeah. them. You know, because I appreciate that everyone is a blessing. Absolutely. You know? The enrichment that it brings. Oh. I mean, there's no greater gift in this world than to, you know, procreate. Amen. I believe in, in the, you know, earthly realm this is the greatest blessing and that's how it was received by many people and you know for people to look at it and see it as a curse even Christians you know when they see you having like you know we've got three children my wife is pregnant they go oh poor you my wife's saying no wealthy me do you know what I mean it's like 
you don't realize, you know, I've, I've never met a person on their dying bed saying, I wish I didn't have my children. Mm. But there are plenty of people dying who say, I wish I had more children. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. um, obviously there's not enough time to talk about the, your ministry life, but you've, you've done quite a bit. You know, you've traveled with Russell Sage. You've also traveled with Dave Hodgson and the Kingdom Investors, and you've brought their, um, you know, their teachings here in the business uh, world and recently uh, journeying with the Australian Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, yeah. a wonderful group of people, I've been part of that and you know, Absolutely. I've been cheering you on in that. Yeah. I think it's tremendous what the Lord has, um, the leadership and the influence He has brought you up to. What legacy do you want to leave behind? What would you like to be known by? Look, I mean, you, you talk about a number of different things that I've been involved in. I've been blessed that I have, God has connected me with wonderful people. Yeah. Like you mentioned Russell. Um, yeah. He's, can, he's already been in on the show. Oh, he's been in the hot seat. Yeah. Um, you probably have the cameras a bit lower for him though. Yes. Um, so yeah, Russell, Wendy Yap, you know, yeah. Dave Balestri, yeah. there's... Um, John Mack, yourself, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I've had a number of different people that God has connected with me with that yeah. just pour into my life, you know? Yeah. Um, they continue to, I've got, God's connected me bizarrely because I'm not a typical minister, I'm a businessman. Of course. But God has somehow opened a door. I mean, I've got great friendships with Nick Scott yeah. and Ab Meredith and I've had the opportunity to travel around the world with them. Yes. Um, I just want to be able to help people yeah. come to know God. And I, I just like to do what I'm told, quite yeah. frankly. I, I don't think there's any magic. One of the things that Dave Hodgson has taught me is uh, he constantly tells everybody how he he's no genius that knows yeah. how to do all this stuff. He just spends a day a week with God, listens to instructions, carries sure. out the instructions, and then goes back for inst more instructions. Yeah. It's that it's that simple, and that's kind of a pattern that Jesus led as well. Yeah. He went and he waited on the Father. Yeah. And as it says, I only did what the f I see the Father doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's titles, there's ministries, there's all that kind of... I actually don't care about any of that. For me, it's all the same thing. I'm just serving God. I'm just doing what God tells me to do. And if other people are blessed as a result of that and get to move closer to Christ, that's really all I care about. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I, I like that. I think we're going to title this show Just Serving God because I think uh, that obedience sums up our Christian walk. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a wonderful time you know just to listen to this some parts i knew some i didn't know mm. but it's also very refreshing for me you know you've been a good mate and a wonderful warrior mm. a brave heart in the kingdom and uh, i'm excited for the next chapter of life for you and uh, nadia mm. and hope wonderful thanks nice. well friends uh, thank you for joining us for kingdom stories from down under you heard from bobby aiken what an amazing life what an amazing testimony God restores lives and he brings them into such a dimension that we can influence and bless other people. His heart is to serve, just to simply serve the Lord. And look, if we can simply do that, I believe we'll go away, uh, a long way in our ministry and in our personal walk with the Lord. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe, share it, um, tell others about it and get more and more people involved to watch this to listen to this on the podcast if you're on apple Podcasts, we would value if you could just uh, give us five stars rating you know we have to ask for it because uh, it's helpful and uh, apple will promote this a bit better and it would encourage other people to watch this content or listen to this content thank you so much for joining us from australia and we hope to see you soon thank you for joining us on kingdom stories from down under We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.